Greetings film fans and JPC News viewers, welcome to Not Too Critical Reviews. I'm your host Renard, and I can finally say that none of the four new films I will review for you this week are bad. Three 2016 releases, one 2015 holdover, all relatively good films. Let's begin with the 2015 holdover, a bizarre animated film by the name of Anomalisa. The most recent offering by illustrious writer Charlie Kaufman, stop motion animation director Duke Johnson, and starring David Thewlis, Jennifer Jason Lee, and Tom Noonan. What is it to ache? What is it to be alive? Each person you speak to has had a day. Some of the days have been good, some bad. Anomalisa, adapted from Kaufman's 2005 sound play of the same name, is a most bizarre film. In its barest essence, it centers on the most mundane subject, a dull business trip. The stop motion animation is off-putting, imperfect, and yet, whether an audience member will understand the story's psychological intricacies or not, the employment of Tom Noonan's voice for every character but those voiced by Thulis and Lee being one very key tip-off, one will realize that the film is so, so much more. I was just looking for someone. Uh, I, th I think I've got the wrong... Who's there, Em? Oh my god. Hello? Oh, do I look awful? I was just taking my makeup off. Oh my god. Ugh! Don't, don't look at me! Hello? No. You look lovely. Anomalisa is not for everyone. Its R rating due to one particular sequence, not to mention the strong language, pretty much guarantees that. And yet, for those who have the patience as well as the maturity to sit and watch a film about dolls, it will most certainly strike a chord in the deepest recesses of the soul. I think you're extraordinary. Why? I don't know yet. It's just obvious to me that you are. Sorry, I grabbed your hand. It's okay. It's a reflex, but I don't like to fly. I said it's okay. You can let go now, though. I give Anomalisa four out of five stars. Next up is Disney's latest live action offering, the historical disaster drama The Finest Hours, directed by Craig Gillespie and starring Chris Pine, Casey Affleck, and Ben Foster. Why don't you go up on deck and have a look? Jesus, Mary Joseph! Make yourself a crew. You assist that ship, you hear? Yes, sir. He's sending you out to die. I'm gonna do my best to get out there. I know those water's pretty good. The Finest Hours recounts the true story of the U.S. Coast Guard's 1952 rescue of the crippled SS Pendleton tanker off the coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. That story is gripping enough, and any Coast Guard aficionado should know about it. Most others, however, will only get a fair and accurate depiction of an event with solid acting that doesn't exactly stretch itself to truly make it an everlasting cinematic experience. Not those men don't like me? They might not like you, but they'll know to listen to you. Now every fella here wants to live, I need all the help I can get. You gotta set up a watch and look out for a shoal. I need four men, men in the pumps, and the rest of you on a bucket line topside down below. Communicate with the engine room. You heard him, boys! Now move it, come on! As with the recent Will Smith vehicle concussion, The Finest Hours falters from having a romantic subplot that detracts from the story at hand, interspersing the film with both interesting moments as well as dull moments. The final result for the audience is not the finest film about an important but underrated event in American history, but rather merely a fine trek to the multiplex, a trek that they will gradually forget about by the end of the week. I give The Finest Hours 3 out of 5 stars. Our third film is the revenge western and latest figure in production trouble and delay notoriety, Jane Got a Gun, directed by Gavin O'Connor and starring Natalie Portman, Joel Edgerton, Ewan McGregor, and Noah Emmerich. Boys, we got another one dead. People are saying a woman was seen fleeing town. The girl fit the description of our old friend Jane. For a film whose script was on the 2011 blacklist, was originally set to start production in early 2013, regularly switched out directors and actors, didn't actually start production until late summer 2013, and whose original late 2014 release would continue to be pushed back and back until finally landing quietly in theaters in January of 2016. <sighs> This was a completely and thoroughly serviceable revenge western, composed of fairly large, enjoyable scraps of a once bold vision. Natalie Portman is a decent lead. Where is 
Shiggy. But it is Joel Edgerton and character actor and O'Connor regular Noah Emmerich who stand out. Ewan McGregor has plenty of fun playing a Western villain, albeit an underwritten one. Yeah, but Jane, if I tell you that, what am I left with? Nothing. <laughs> Even the final standoff with its Home Alone-esque traps was fun to watch in the theater despite its disorienting camera work. In the end, Jane Got a Gun isn't a salvage disaster of Fantastic Four proportions, but it's clear that its production problems kept it from becoming a solid western gem for 2016. I'm gonna protect it. I give Jane Got a Gun 3 out of 5 stars. The final film for this episode is the animated action family comedy Kung Fu Panda 3, directed by Alessandro Carloni and Jennifer Yeah Nelson, and starring Jack Black as Poe, the titular panda. An incredible power awaits you. Hey! Justice is about to be served! We'll have two justice platters, please. Tigress, did you want extra sauce with that? She wants it on the side. On the side. On the side. I was concerned about this film even after I realized that DreamWorks pushed it out of its original release slot last December due to Star Wars. The first Kung Fu Panda was a major surprise and a gorgeous one at that. The sequel, while just as beautiful and effective in uncovering more of main character Poe's clouded origins, felt manufactured in its drama. Not so with this third installment. Yes, this film has its issues, including using up time for lowbrow humor that could have been used for the more serious character interactions and themes, and almost setting up Kate Hudson's panda character as a potential love interest, thank goodness that didn't happen. All of these result in a relatively faster paced film that somehow feels shorter than either of the first two installments, weirdly enough. Kai has returned! Who? The master of pain, beast of vengeance, maker of widows. Mm -hmm. Okay, I used to work with Uguay. Oh, Master Uguay! Uguay. Silence! <laughs> However, the film's strength lies in its deep narrative reach with high stakes that matches that of the first film, including the different fathers' conflict. And when the film finds the need to condense time, they fill it in with gorgeously animated epic montages. These elements culminate in a final 15 minutes that's enthralling, delightful, and thoroughly satisfying. The final result is a film that takes some committed moments to be serious, but doesn't forget to relish how awesome it is at the same time. This is Master Flying Rhino's battle armor. I wonder what this does. I should pull it. I give Kung Fu Panda 3 4 out of 5 stars. This week's cinema going advice, you should definitely check out the animated fair. The adults can enjoy Anomalisa while the kids enjoy Kung Fu Panda 3. Meanwhile, keep crossing off entries from your queue of current Oscar nominated films. Thanks for tuning into these reviews. Have you seen any good films lately? Old? New? In the theater? At home? What are your thoughts on the films in this episode? Be sure to let us know in the comments section down below. Please be sure to like this video and to also check out any of our show's previous episodes by subscribing to the JPC News channel and like the JPC News Facebook page. I'm Renard, and this is Not Too Critical Reviews. See you next time.